Amen. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Hope everyone's doing well. It's good to see you. To be here together as a family of God again, seeking to learn a little bit more how our Creator thinks. It's uh, one thing's for sure, it's not like I think. How about you? It's uh, so amazing how we want to lean on our own understanding only to find out that it's uh, not that impressive. Amen. As we uh, proceed this morning on this teaching, as in the days of Noah, these days that we're living in, it is a, um, it's a time that, uh, as in the days of Noah, it says, uh, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The excitement is, is the coming of Christ. The, the downside is, as in the days of Noah, and uh, so it's kind of like a kind of like a quarter or a nickel or a penny. It it's got two sides to it, but it's the same thing. And uh, we can and so we sometimes have a hard time justifying how we have these two uh, big contrast in what's actually really happening. And I submit to you the same logic or understanding as a coin. It has two sides that look totally different, but yet they are the, uh, the same piece of, of monies, if you will. They, they signify, they stand for the same uh, thing, whether it be a quarter, a penny, or a nickel, it's still standing for the same thing. And so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And uh, these days of Noah versus his coming as we continue on here, I can, um, in these times that we're living, we can see that we've got two things basically to speak about if I want to be in current events, if you will. One is the coming of Christ and the other one is in the days of Noah. So uh, neither one of those, both of those topics are kind of epic topics, if you will. They're... Um, I know in this day we would like to see things kind of calm down and let's get back to normal. But if this is as in the days of Noah, I don't know that we're going to find normal. I think we're going to find two epic times running alongside of each other at the same time. So just, uh, I hope you have a good memory and you can remember how things were when they were normal. And uh, perhaps you could have a dream or two on that to remind you. So we see the time period here. It says we are living in a time period that is spoken more about than any other time period in the Bible. So we can see that it's justifiable that we spend this much time, and this is a prophetic class. This is not a, a preaching class, if you will. This is a prophetic class. And um, so it gives us more about the, uh, the current events. Now, we're in a time, what I call a time of deceptions, and this is like, wow. Uh, we are living in a day of deceptions. Now, does that mean uh, the coming of the, of the Son of Man? There's a lot of non-deceptions out there that are truths, uh, but yet we're living in a day of deceptions, and that's something we just have to, I think we just have to, to own up to or come to terms with that we are living in these days of great deceptions. And not, it's not that we haven't always had deceptions with us. Of course we have, but now we can honestly say there's more deception now, I believe, than there's ever been. <clears throat> so Jesus came along and said this. He said, it's not a suggestion, but a command. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Now he is speaking this uh, you know, right before, of course, he... Uh, wasn't long till he went to the cross, but he was saying, okay, you're going to have this day uh, of great deception. Now, as we look at the scripture, Paul gave the Colossian church a warning because there were people out there that wanted to rob them and to deceive them. So we look, go to the book of Colossians to get a lot of our understanding in the last two weeks 
we spent our time there on a couple of verses, which we'll not redo that. We will reread it. Uh, but he goes on, he says basically two things in this verse as Paul's warning the uh, Colossian church about this great deceptions. And like I said, we've been going over that for two weeks. What are they? But here is the verse. He says, beware and not according to Christ. He says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So here we see uh, Paul is giving us two instructions. He says, number one, he says to beware. And uh, then he says there's some things that are done that are not according to Christ. Now, this is the fuzzy area that we're in today of deception is that um, we're under this idea that <clears throat> that's in there again, that's what political correctness is. Political correctness is uh, man, <coughs> excuse me, is man bringing to the table what he thinks is morally correct. That's what happens. Uh, he says, beware, not according to Christ. So we've always had this battle since Genesis that it's the battle of about what God says versus what man says. So it's not like there's a new battle here. It's the same battle, what God says, and what man says. So as we're in this time of deception, there was deception there in the beginning, but in these days, the deception ramps up more and more, but is still under the heading of what God says versus what man says. So everything around us today, that is our, that is the battle, except it just keeps accelerating. <coughs> and how will that be done? In Paul's examples here, he says it's through philosophy, empty deceit, he says, according to the traditions of men, and we went through that in the last few weeks. And he also goes on to say, according to the basic uh, principles of the world. So there we see uh, basically four avenues in which he says that this deceit uh, will probably come through. Now, he goes on to say some things according to Christ, and we started on that last week a little bit. It says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of Godhead body, bodily, uh, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So we go into Colossians here. The apostle Paul is uh, giving us, now this is the next verse. So we've got all the deceit, how it will happen. And then he goes into this, what is according to Christ. And he goes on with this, uh, that you have a fullness to Paul introduces us to this spiritual idea that as believers, we have ob obtained something here. Thank you, John. We have obtained here something that the Bible starts referring to as fullness. So the first thing I ask you when you hear the word fullness, well, what do you think of? You think of something that is being filled up, right? It's, it's a completeness of being full. You could say right to the verge of running over, perhaps. And even though I believe that fullness does get to a place of overflow, but that's not for today. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say this fullness, and then he says you're complete in him. Now, why in the world the apostle Paul, why did he put in there this verse that you're complete in him? It's because this is the message that comes against the deception. This is the message. This is the truth, if you will. If you're going to make a deceitful message, if you're going to take it on and you're going to make it null and void, the antidote to this disease of deception is fullness, completeness. Now, as Christians and believers, we'll just skip right over that. You can hear the words and say, okay, I'm complete. Okay, I'm full. Let's go to the next thing. But I submit to you, there's the, the fullness and, and completeness in Christ might be deeper than we might think. If that is, if, if that, the completeness in Christ, everything that in deceptional, uh, that's dished out deceptionally to us, 
has to first go through this filter of completeness in Christ. So if anything's out there that would lead me to think I'm not complete in Christ, it probably has some type of deception. Most of the deception is coming from this idea, it's a religious spirit, if you will. It's this idea that if you'll do what I'm saying and doing, you will then be more complete, you see. So it's the perfectionist idea, it's the... <clears throat> it's this idea that we're more complete when the scriptures, and according to Paul here, says you are complete. Now that to me is a mouthful. In my human brain, it doesn't make sense. In my spirit man, it's of necessity that I accept that, and I, I get it. In my rational mind, still, there's a fight. Uh, surely he doesn't really mean complete. And, uh, but I think he does really mean complete. Now let's look at it. You are complete in him, Colossians 2, 9 through 10. He goes on to say, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So here we see that not only are you complete in him, and in him he is the head of all principalities and power. <clears throat> so if you're in him, and he's the head of all of this stuff, does that not put you in a pretty good position? I would say yes. That puts us in a pretty good position uh, for the, all of this deception. Uh, your completeness is because what? He is complete. That's, that's why we're complete. It's not because in ourselves we're complete. It's because he, but you see, once we start seeing these truths, the value of what we have received in Christ starts going up, right? It, it starts going up. And not only that, our appreciation for what Christ did at the cross increases. It says you're complete, having no deficiency or perfect. That's what the definition of the word means. No deficiency, but you are you are perfect. And you say, well, Alan, I, I sure don't I sure don't feel perfect, <laughs> right? I, I don't I don't feel like I feel like I have many deficiencies, and and I I do not I feel like I'm a long ways from from being perfect. So how in the world do I justify how I feel and what the Bible says I am? Well, could it be if I start walking into who I am that I'll start feeling more like who I am? That's the question. You see, you see faith is what moves mountains. So we are to have faith in who we are becoming. You see, so our faith is who we're becoming, not in who we are. And, it's, it, and that's misappropriation of faith. Now, for some reason, God's given us this permission uh, to have this faith factor, which, is, which basically is denying, denying reality. Can you hear me? So, so God's created this thing called faith. Now, you see, you can have faith in a lot of things, but it's important to what faith is attached to. I'll give you an example. I can have faith that I could jump off this building and fly. Well, I think my faith would be attached to something right dumb, stupid. Or I could have faith in God's word. In other words, if you attach your faith to truth, can you hear me? Then it becomes a supernatural spiritual element that changes you, changes me. One day I got born again because I believed in something that I couldn't do for myself. Truth is, I compare it to my to my little story there. Compared to that is, uh, uh, I I thought I, I knew I couldn't fly. I was lost. I knew I couldn't do anything. And then all of a sudden, I was given this faith to believe in a ridiculous story that a man died across the waters in a country I've never been in. And he was nailed to a cross and then he died and he rose again the third day. And if I'd believe that ridiculous story, I could have eternal life. So what happens? That that. That was presented to me, and I just said yes. And then all of a sudden, I believed it. 
I did not muster up the belief in myself because I reached out to God begging for mercy, if you will. Because of my reaching out, God gave me a gift of faith to believe the ridiculous story. And I stand in front of you today and I believe every word of it. And I'm somewhat amazed because I tend to be a rational person at times, believe it or not. I continue to be amazed that I believe it. But I believe it more than life itself. So I then learned there's a trans spiritual transaction that goes on here when, get, when God issues us an amount of faith to believe in something. Now, I do not stand before you with all faith, but I do stand before you with a measure of faith. And so if I have a measure of faith, that means my measure can increase. And so I'm not near as radical and crazy as I want to be in Christ because I'm complete in him. Could you imagine if we walked around with the completeness of the faith of Christ, would we not have greater works? Absolutely. Absolutely. What could be the limiting factor? The limiting factor could be that I've not given over a part of myself, that God might issue me another measure of faith, that I could even believe more ridiculous things that aren't, but that I see almost as if they were, that they become. Then I find myself as a spiritual being in tandem with God in, the, in creation. I'm creating things with God because he issues me that faith when I give up this part of me of unbelief. So Paul, is, he, he, he has a purpose in barreling in on this idea of completeness. Uh, it's not that I'm living up to that completeness, but it's that the completeness is already offered. It's already there. And as I have faith to believe in this completeness, it can become more real to me. Amen. And that's what we're looking for. Do you not think, though, we need to first understand our, where we really are and have at least an honest confession with ourselves and God where we really are? And you know, I've, I, I have even walked in superficial faith, acting like I had faith that I didn't have, but yet spiritually or religiously I'm supposed to have it, you know. And the truth is I don't really have it, but others expect me to have it, so I'll act like I have it knowing full well I don't really have it. And uh, so as we live and walk in transparency of truth, then it allows my faith, just remember this, your faith is to be attached to truth. And you can have faith in things that are not true. But we're wanting to attach our faith to truth. And so Paul, as he's trying to com combat this deceiving spirit that's out here. Uh, and, then when, and there again, we've got to come to terms with the fact we are living in deceptive times. It's okay. Don't get too bent out of shape. This is where we are. God, since we're complete in Christ, the revelation of that completeness should be more real to God's people today than it's ever been. Not less, but it should be more because of the deceptive times we're living in. And so therefore, we're going to need more revelation of this completeness uh, in him. And it's here that the uh, one way we can tell if we're walking in a measure of completeness is the peace of God, the passive all understanding. And that peace is a true test. The religious spirit was wanting to add to the message, and that's what happens in being deceived. It either wants to add to, I should even put there, take away. It wants to add to or take away from the message of God. I've taken you through the teaching of how the far left uh, progressivism has stolen our call to the, to the lost world. It's, it's stolen our, our call, but yet it calls people in but doesn't, doesn't give them the message. And so that's what happens in being deceptive. You either do not give the whole thing or you, or you give a, uh, something that appears to be true that's not. Uh, if you have Christ, you have it all. Plus nothing, minus nothing. You, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, complete, having no deficiency, and you're perfect. Now, look at this. Completeness is what I put here. Completeness is what keeps you. 
uh, as we're all striving to walk in the completeness of Christ, there's a lot of times we feel like we're incomplete in, in areas. But as we're walking into whom we're going to be, which is an act of faith, by the way, as we, the, the, the thought of the truth, when I add my faith to this truth that I'm complete in him, is what calls, helps me not to be devastated uh, when I'm not seeing that working out in my life. Can you hear that? Now, why does God allow us to do that? He's got something that's called grace. Grace is uh, this unmerited favor that allows us to be in this interim time, if you will, until we walk into completeness. Uh, believe it or not, grace will not always be needed. There will be a time I'm, we're going to be just like him, the Bible says, right? And so the grace of God is needed when we're striving and walking in this completeness. Now, completeness keeps you, and that is the truth. So keep that. The reason I'm saying it like this is that's to be a foundational understanding of the Christian life, that completeness is what keeps us. Now, what is the greatest deception in the Bible? We're going to get into this one. Now, there's deception. We're living in deceptive times. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm now going to get into a... Um, Excuse me. A time of what is the greatest deception. Now this one sometimes throws us all a little bit. That's the reason I want us to get a hold of the completeness and the message of being complete in him. Because if you are complete in him, the greatest deception will not overtake you. All right? Now, 2 Thessalonians, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There's a deception that's greater than deception on the earth, and that's when God sends it. You can say, Alan, surely not. Does he send deception? He says he sends a delusion. Now, we're going to go into this a little bit to see why in the world would God do that? I thought God was all merciful, and, and, and he was always loved people, and, and, and the answer to all of that is, is yes. But you got to allow God to be, uh, to be God. I mean, God is God. Uh, I'll, this probably isn't the proper way to say it, but he's got a personality. Uh, God's God. He's, he's our king. Aren't, don't, aren't you glad for that? He's our savior. He's full of mercy. And he's our judge. Uh-oh. You know, if we could just leave that one off. You know, God, God's a lot of thing in Scripture. And we like to hang our hat on two or three parts of, his, of who he is. But God is all of the above. Why? Because God is God. And for some reason, uh, God in his uh, all-knowingness that he is, there's something about this judgment thing that is important. And if you see that you are complete in him, guess what? You will escape the wrath to come. You missed a wonderful place to say amen. I think I had you scared. Uh, that's a good thing. You will escape the wrath to come. And uh, so that's another thing that the completeness in him, because we are in a time that it appears some things are winding up or winding down, if you will. And I know we've had other times like that, but I would not be representing the scriptures properly if I didn't say that, that we are living in these times, so it's important. Now watch this. The great deception is associated with the satanic work of the Antichrist and his displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. So here we got something going on here. Here's this story. There's going to be this great delusion, if you will. And I'll be very, very honest with you. I am somewhat hoping not, but have a great concern that this great delusion has already been released upon our nation. I have a great concern. Doesn't mean it has, but I have a great concern uh, but what it hasn't been somewhat released. I'm praying that not you see, but I do have a great concern for that. Now, 
uh, and we've and we got to understand that God releases this. Uh, re I didn't point that out, but he releases this before the Antichrist comes out on the, on the scene. And it says this in Thessalonians 2, 9. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and uh, lying wonders we see here. <laughs> so this is a precursor to that. So strong delusion, what does that mean? Delusion means an illusion, hallucination, if you will, a mirage, meaning something that is believed to be true or real, but that is actually false or unreal. And, and it goes on, you've got to say, how can we believe something that's delusional? Well, believe it or not, as humans, we are in more delusion than you would ever know. Because it just so happens you think that everything in your mind right now is perfect and without error. I'm sorry. That's basically what most people believe. I mean, for sure you're believing it the best you know how. But what if part of what you were thinking was delusional? What if it's like a, I promise you everything that you think that's true in your mind right now is not true. Everything couldn't be, right? So there's some things in there that's off. Delusion implies an inability to distinguish between what is real and what only seems to be real, often as a result of disordered state of mind or mental illness. So if you're believing a lie, you are mentally ill. You like that one? There you go. There you are. You believe a lie, you actually are mentally ill. You're delusional. You're hallucinating. You're believing something that's true that's not true. So, the, the, the sad part, you say, well, how can we do that? Well, the way, the way we do it is we do it in little things, and then you'll do it in big things. You'll do it with family matters. You'll do it at work, things at work. Well, I know they're out to get me. You're hallucinating. How do I know that? They don't care that much about you. You see, so, but, but my point is this. The way you swallow the big lie is you is you participate. You're, you're agreeing with all these little lies everywhere, so you're being set up for the biggie. So it's important that we're, as a Christian, our greatest spiritual experience should be repentance daily. That is our greatest spiritual uh, experience is repentance. That I want to, God will fill up what's true when we do away with what's a lie. And in the fullness of His Spirit, He'll convict us of sin. He'll get us in a, what Paul calls a sound mind. Anybody want a sound mind? Did you know that a sound mind is very peaceful? What makes a mind not peaceful? It's not sound. It's, it's delusional. You got a little mental illness going on there. I hope that offends you enough to look into it now. Um, God will, in in times uh, judgment, send a powerful delusion so that people that reject the truth will believe the lie. Now, th this is where it gets a little dicey. See, God has this wonderful time with me and with you, us sitting here. He's given us a wonderful opportunity to take his word and believe the truth. If you're sitting here under the sound of my voice and watching online and you are entertaining the ideas that you can't see why the church is so hard line on the world, I'll submit to you it's not near hard line enough. We are still trying to make the gospel presentable and, and, and we want to tone it down enough so people will receive it. That's not the way the gospel works. The gospel hits you in the face, offends you, makes you cry probably. You repent, then the gospel takes over and starts changing you into something that you're not, but you're gonna be. So is the, the delusion is out there to soften us as believers to the true word of God. And in this age of deception, uh, you see, please get this. The reason God is going to send a delusion is because he's convinced you're not going to change your mind. You've rejected him. 
We have rejected the truth. So if you're sitting in here today and God's been throwing a truth at you over and over and over and over, do not think that God, there won't be a day that he maybe won't do that anymore. I mean, people are under this idea that God just goes on forever. He doesn't. He, he doesn't. Uh, ask Pharaoh. God hardened his heart. That always seemed unfair to me. Does that not seem unfair to you? Go, but now God, that's just not fair. You hardened his heart. Why did he harden his heart? Because he knew he wasn't going to change his heart. So he said, okay, if you want some of that, I'm going to give you some more. See how you like it. So listen, God plays hardball. He don't play softball. I'm just, he, just, he just doesn't. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they should be saved. That's what happens when God sends judgment, when God sends this delusion or he allows this a mental illness. Let's look into it just a little quicker. The same passage is in 2 Thessalonians also speaks of a, also of a great apostasy, it says. Similar apostasies are also predicted. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, it says, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's in 1 Timothy uh, 4, 1. So we can see, is it possible to start leaning or agreeing with the doctrines of devils? Uh, just talking to believers here. Now the answer is yes. And to someone like me, I, I believe in eternal security. And to someone like me, these verses give me a problem. <laughs> Just so you'll know. Here it says, an act of refusing to continue to follow, obey. This is what apostasy is. Uh, to obey or recognize a religious faith. Abandonment of a previous loyalty or defection. Now, do you know of anybody that, uh, is it possible for, you can know of anybody, is it possible for us to do this? Yeah, the answer is yes. It's, it's very possible. You can say, well, Alan, I'd never totally uh, go against the faith. Well, you maybe wouldn't, but what if you did 10%, 20%, 30%? I mean, yeah, are, what percentage of, of your faith are you hanging on to? and still trying to say, stay acceptable to the world and acceptable to God. You see, that's, that's the question. Now, this is something I don't know. I don't know if being saved can tolerate 10% or not. You'll have to talk to God about that. I don't know. This I do know is I'm complete in Him. And there again, there's scripture that um, I personally believe that, well, I'm not gonna get into that. I'll get sidetracked. Okay. People are complacent when in deception. Now you say, well, Alan, what does that word mean? I had to look it up because I knew that's what it was showing. Uh, complacent involved with others in illegal activity or wrong uh, doing. So you say, all right, now, now understand this. When in deception, you're agreeing with the enemy. When in deception, you're agreeing with those that are doing wrong. That's what it means. Uh, so you can say, well, no, Alan, I've just got sympathy. Well, I mean, we, we all know we can love the sin. and, and uh, I mean, we love the sinner and hate the sin. We all understand that, right? Uh, that's what the Bible says. I'll tell you what, what my sister, one of my sisters says. She says, a hard head makes a sore fanny. I got to, surely I don't have to interpret that, but uh, in other words, it's, it's the same thing. We can be we can be so hard headed that we keep running in our hard headedness. We keep running against this brick wall. God keeps sending us correction, but yet we won't let it go. And I saw this little cartoon of this dog run up to this grill where there's some steaks, and he grabbed a steak off the grill and went running, but he was hollering all the way with the steak burning his mouth. When he finally got to his bed and laid down with the steak, he couldn't eat the steak because he burned his mouth. In other words, we want what we think we want and we run after it, yet God sends us correction and revelation, but yet we won't turn. 
So what happens is we, we're involved with others in illegal activity or wrongdoing. That means you're in deception. Is what it is. Complicity is the participation in a complete criminal act of an accomplice, a partner in the crime, who aids or encourages other uh, uh, predators of the crime that who shared with them an intent to act to complete the crime. In other words, that's what I have problem with progressive Christianity. And you, you put your rainbow flag out and say, all right, everybody come on in here and we're, it's okay, uh, get, uh, homosexuality's okay, uh, everything, everything's okay, you see. Well, what, well, what's happening there, you're actually agreeing with it. You can say, well, no, I, I've just got a, the heart of, of Christ for it. And I'm, and I'm off, but there again, you've got to make the distinction. You've got to be able to see that is the call. We're calling everybody to come in here. But then we want to have a message that brings conviction of the heart that the Holy Spirit can change us. You do come as you are, but you don't stay as you is. Right? And so, and so that's, but that's, but we've got to understand when we in our own, uh, everybody, I say everybody, humanity has a problem with wanting, wanting to be somebody's savior. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's wanting to shave her head and say, well, I actually saved this person. Well, yeah, but you know, I, I, I helped them and all this. And um, it's a savior complex where we're feeling like we're somebody's savior or we're going to save them. And, and, but, but what happens you, in trying to be that as a human, we end up agreeing with, with what's wrong, trying to show love. That, that's, not, that's not the truth. The truth is that's not love. The truth of love is I tell you the truth. Now you can do it in a loving way. Uh, but I don't know if you're going to die and go to hell, how loving it needs to be. I, I, to me, it's all right if, if it scares the hell out of us. I, I don't see a thing wrong with that. I mean, the Apostle Paul said that. He, he, he didn't mind it sometimes, the way he gave the message. And it was just, it was just so real and so out there and in your face. Um, but anyway, so we want to understand what happens when we yield. For they reject the truth and prefer lies, in 2 Timothy. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So what happens is we would prefer the lie versus the truth. How do you know you're preferring a lie sometimes over the truth? It's because you don't want to hear the truth. One is, way is you quit reading your Bible, you, you quit listening to perhaps Christian music or whatever. Uh, you're, I'm not going to have anything to do with the church anymore. You start pulling everything away. Well, you can say, well, I have my reasons for that. And I can tell you, if you're not careful, you're going to be led into deception. There's, there's a lot of people that keep going to a church that they don't really want to go to you know why? Because it's the right thing to do. You say, well, Alan, what? Uh, how do you get that? Well, if God led you there, God led you there. He, he maybe led you there to be part of, of, of how to fix it, right? So anyway, here we, here we go. The great deception is the consequence of people who refuse to believe the truth. So it says God's going to send this uh, delusion, but you've got to understand that's a consequence that's a consequence uh, of people who refuse to the, believe the truth. And it's okay, but what I'm, I'm praying we don't do, it's okay to point, it's, it's normal for us to point a finger at other people, but we're supposed to read this in light of ourselves. That's, that's the whole idea here. The great deception is a consequence of people or me uh, who refuse to believe the truth. And do I believe all truths? Well, I believe all that I know is true. Um, but the truth is, I think there's some truths yet for me to believe. I, I, I just do. Because I've seen people walk in uh, what appears to be more faith than I have and that I walk in. You say, well, Alan, how, how do you know that? I, it's because they make me uncomfortable. <laughs> that's, that's why people that of great faith tend to make us that aren't uncomfortable uh, to a certain level. But I know that it was best for me to seek after this great faith because I believe it's going to take great faith to 
be able to survive in the deception of this world and the great delusion that God's going to send. 2 Thessalonians 2, 19, 2, 9 through 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perisheth, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Wow, that's so scary. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. There's your judgment part of God, right? Not necessarily the king side, but the judgment side. Uh, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now there's a key. Pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a difference. At times being unrighteous, but not having pleasure in it. How do you know that it's pleasure in unrighteousness? It's because it usually has an addictive nature to it and you participate daily. That means you're having pleasure, and it's a worldly pleasure uh, in unrighteousness. Delusion is a belief that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is reality or a rational argument. Typically a, a symptom of, there you are again, a mental disorder. What is sin? Sin is disagreeing with God. That's what it is. Sin is disagreeing with God. Now, for us to disagree with God, I'd have to say somebody's mentally ill, wouldn't you? Now, God's delusion is when he gives you what you want. All right, we're getting a little further into the delusion. The delusion is, whether you know it or not, God's been holding back a lot of things that you want because you don't need it. So when God sends a delusion, you got to understand he's pulling his hand back and let you have what you want. That's part of the delusion, it says. Delusion is a consequence of rejecting the truth. If you're delusional in your mind, it's because you're rejecting true reality. Now, a lot of times it takes somebody, and truthfully, the, it's nice when it's under the direction of the Holy Spirit, to point out to us where we are delusional, where we are believing uh, lies. The truth sets us free and keeps us from delusion. See that? After people have refused the truth for so long, God will allow them to have what they desire. How sad. That's what happens. It's, it's just uh, self-destructive, so God, of course, God's convinced uh, now, there's one thing about God. You've got to say, well, if God's convinced, uh, he must know that they're not going to change. Well, we got a couple of times in the Bible where God changed his mind, even though he was convinced. So I hang on to those verses. <laughs> you know, I totally hang on to those verses. I said, and, you know, Moses petitioned God, you know, hey, God, don't, you don't need to wipe them out. You're going to give yourself a bad reputation. I tried that one time, it didn't work for me. But, but it worked for him, you know, it worked out good. Now, we see a similar pattern even in Romans 118, where people rejected God's truth for so long that he simply abandons them to their own sinfulness. Now, there again, this is just so important. Uh, I can't say how important it is because it's, it's important that we deal with our sin. That is very, very, very important. And the reason is you will start thinking that your sin's okay. And, and it's not so much that it, God dis, says you shouldn't do it. It's because where it's taken you is not good. He's trying to save you from this destruction. Uh, it's... It, when, see, when, so when God does this and he pulls back his hand and he gives us what we want, listen, I've even wanted some things that I thought were godly, only to come to find out it was selfish ambition. Is it, has that happened to anybody or did I get to corner on that market, right? And it's amazing how many things that I thought were good, then as I've gotten older and I look back, I'm like, oh my land, Alan, what were you thinking? And, uh, and I'm just so thankful that God would, would convict me 
uh, over time and didn't pull his hand back that I might sooner or later see it. Nonetheless, if you're carrying on an open conversation with God about a particular sin and you're asking God uh, uh, to, do, to help you do something about it, uh, I submit to you, he maybe is and you're not. Uh, so that, because there is a point that God will not. It seems that they have crossed the point of no return. Now, this is scriptural. Romans 1, 18 through 25. And I'll just start with this one slide and we'll have to pick up here next week. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Excuse. You can say, so that I am without excuse. Because that when they knew God, now watch this, it's a little tricky here. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. It didn't say they were non-believers. It says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. So I ask you the question, if you know God in here today, do you glorify him as God? Do you gripe and complain and go around with the victim mentality on how bad of a life God's given you? Or do we glorify God? Now, that, this verse is corrective in nature. You can say, well, Alan, I'm not convicted of that. Well, I'd line up with it till I was. Glorified not him as God. Neither were thankful. Well, that's none of us, I'm sure. But because vain in their imagination. So this gives me an idea that if I glorify not God and I'm not thankful, it's a good chance I'm going to have vain imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. There's two things there that gives you vain imaginations and a foolish heart. One is you glorify not God. And what's the other one? You're just not thankful. Now to me, just a layman in the faith, I'm like, God, wouldn't it be harder than that to have a darkened heart, a foolish heart and a dark heart and imaginations? Is, is that all I've got to do is be thankful and glorify you as God? You see, the point is, this is the true spiritual equation to not take on deceit, to not be fooled, not to have a vain imagination. That's what that is. There's two things, there's two things we need. You don't need to inspect everything that comes in the door and say, was this deceitful as this is? This is not. This is. No, do two things. Glorify God and be thankful. Those two things will keep you. All right, we've got a lot more scripture next week. We're going to stop there. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for this day. I ask and pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, be with us this day. I pray, Lord Jesus, as we are looking at the deception that is around us, we'd be wide-eyed and we'd look at it and we would repent and confess. Lord Jesus, I ask and pray that you go with us in this next hour of worship. I pray that you'd be with us. Pray that you'd be with uh, Theo Koulianos as he comes with us and speaks to us today. Let your Holy Spirit be in this place, O oh God. Give us revelation. <clears throat> Let us encounter your presence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <laughs>